Aren't you thankful for the blood on a Tuesday night? Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. Turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 8, if you would. I want to turn your attention to verse number 22. And i um, thankful for all that is upcoming. And don't forget to keep watch on the website, our social media content, keeping everything available for you. We thankful that thankfully we can slow down enough on Tuesday nights to go over all that some at least some of all that we have um, in store for the church. Aren't you thankful for what God's been doing? Amen. Amen. We had an outstanding weekend in the Holy Ghost that is um, matched by the last few weekends, unable just to make the schedule do anything other than what we made it to do, there's, there's no telling and there's no way to go back and quantify every message that Brother Williams preached, the moving of the Holy Ghost that came. Don't, when important words came to men of God in the Bible, there was always instruction coupled with them. And it sounded like this, John, God's talking you need to write this down, okay? And that's why we have. We, it, it used to be called tape ministry. Anybody remember buying cassette tapes? Okay. And then it was CD ministry. Anybody remember that? Okay. Well, now all you've got to do is open your phone and touch Facebook or touch YouTube, and you've got access to every message. Um, we said, well, I heard them. Yeah, but there are pieces of gold in there. Amen. That we forget what it looks like and the shape of it and exactly how it was said. And, and so, uh, in fact, it's so important and we have had so much come to us that for the next few months we'll probably be backing up and doing some guest preacher sermon highlights in the bulletin. Sister Rachel, Sister Amelia, several who are a part of the media team are working on extracting those statements and it, it we just kind of keep going back to the Tuesday night it's been five weeks ago that brother Zach Wells stood in this pulpit and preached a mighty word of God a mighty word of God a word that if we will take heed it will march us to where we're headed can you say amen 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 you don't want to leave those as unread books so to speak praise God and brother Lopez God bless you thank you for obeying the Holy Ghost over the last few services we are still in the arm twisting process of getting him to preach the complete sermon from Sunday night and we're having to twist his arm and sister Blanca's arm and whoever's arm we need to twist and he let us know that we actually might have access to an interpreter that can be with us more often, especially on Tuesday nights. So keep your ears tuned for that in Jesus' name. It is such a pleasure. Man, I've enjoyed these songs. I mean, I've been touched. I was raised on these songs. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate Sister Jody and our singers. I don't know that there's any prettier piano playing that can be done than by our sister Jody Givens. Can you say amen? Thank you, Jesus. Romans chapter 8. I feel like I'm leaving something unsaid. I'll probably remember it about halfway through my message. And I'll try not to stop and say it. Oh, I got something backwards, Brother Williams. I'm sorry. You were fed poor information. <laughs> so the youth, I'm not sure... Saturday, instead of Friday, youth is Saturday. I, I don't know when Chelsea's in the back. Sister, uh, Brother Alan Michael, you know when they're leaving? They're, yeah, they've sent a text out. It, young people don't pay attention to announcements. In fact, I've come and learned old people don't pay attention to announcements either. Mm, and let the church say amen. In fact, I've come to figure out, brother, ain't nobody pays attention to announcements. So they're going to have their to-do. But tomorrow night at 515, 
We will leave for Gina, which is an hour and a half drive. And so if you want to, you can drive if you want to. If you want to ride the van and spend my gas instead of yours, you're welcome to do that. Let Sister Rachel know, and we'll continue on with that. It's going to be apparently a week of a lot of Brother Cody Marks, and that's not a bad week to have. That's right. and say, we'll make prayer young people through in Jesus' name. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. To wit, the redemption, the adoption which is the redemption, the resurrection, the completion. Because we, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is not seen, or hope that is seen rather, is not hope for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we wait with patience for it. Likewise, it, it sounds like I'm just kind of reading a bunch of different scripture passages because you've all read these passages separate and apart. Amen? Because all the social media posts put these as separate and completely different passages. But in Paul's writings, they run one right after another. Likewise, the Spirit also helped with our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, and we know, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, Them he also justified, and whom he justified them, he also glorified. Can you say amen? Amen. What shall we then? Look at your neighbor and say then. Say what then? What shall we then say to these things? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be? against us. Why don't you raise your hands one more time this evening. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us. the Lord, praise the Lord. We are going to spend some time tonight stitching together Paul's comments to this church. You can be seated in Jesus' name. Paul is quite the gushing author and apparently was the same as a preacher with a lot of spiritually endued knowledge and experience. Uh, it's kind of like the feeling you get setting down with Brother Steve Dross. He's experienced so much. He's been to so many countries, started so many churches, seen so many things. And, and if that's not enough, what he experienced as a child and the stories he was told by his dad, T. Windross. Amen who lived an entire life of missionary work, who then also lived on the stories of his dad, 
who evangelized the nation of El Salvador. Now, you kind of get what I'm saying. They don't ever run out of stuff to say. Paul was the greatest apostolic missionary this world has ever seen. And by the time he took pen to paper and began to write to the church at Rome, as the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul had a lot to say. And we do as is fitting for our minds, our attention spans, which are increasingly growing shorter and shorter, but also just by way of our culture. And we take bite sizes. We, we preach messages. We teach lessons based off of just a scripture. We know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And let's preach just about that. But that's laid on a foundation. And the fact that the Holy Ghost intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, that's worth talking about on a Tuesday night. But that's laid on a foundation. And the fact that hope, we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth. Why would he have hope for? But if we with patience wait for it, and that, that would fulfill the mental and time slot that we have for a Tuesday night. But that's laid on a foundation. And on and on and on, and, and we really can't even start at chapter 8, verse 1, but we will because indeed we are limited by time and mental space. Amen. He, he seems to be ending a thought at the 25th verse of chapter 7 and, and, and segueing, making a larger margin between the completion, though it is foundational to the segue of the next statement, he kind of leaves a particular piece of the building behind. It's complete and begins with this seeming diatribe concerning the tension and the struggle that believers, saints of God, who have been forgiven, their sins have been remitted by baptism. They've been filled with the Holy Ghost, and now they are in a church structure. They, are, they have been discipled. They are disciples. They are operating under disciplines, but they are still struggling in a tension. Amen? Anybody know what that tension feels like? Anybody not know what that tension feels like? Now, that's what I thought I'd get on that one, too. Because there is a tension. When you live life, there is a managing of the earthen vessel that is, that is in, empowered with the Spirit of God. And there is no getting out of it. In fact, I hope tonight I can convince you to quit wasting your time and quit expelling your energy trying to alleviate the tension that comes with being the church. I didn't give my title, but that's what I would like to teach on tonight. Be the church. Look at your neighbor and say, be the church. And so, you're living with a past, but you're also living with a future. And you're living with a yesterday, but you're living with a, a reality of today. It's the tension of having experienced the nature of sin, but having taken on his righteousness. Paul just, in Paul's own unique, special, bombastic style of writing, just jumps in the middle of it. He goes straight to the nucleus of what's going on, and he says, there is therefore now, verse number one, no condemnation. Why you reckon Paul saying that? Don't you reckon the apostle Paul has his finger on the pulse of the church called the church at Rome? And there's a reason he takes an end time. It's one of the most, it's one of the most compacted, juiced up, powerful, explosive chapters of Paul's writing. It's got more than six poetic, some commentators call them Pauline gushes. 
where it's like it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds and then he just blows up and says things like, oh, wretched man that I am. Don't you think he's talking on purpose? And he understands there are people who are, who are, who are living trying to manage the emotion of condemnation. And boy, he just comes out of the corner swinging. If you're walking in the spirit and not in the flesh, he's not talking to people walking in the flesh. He's not talking to backsliders. He's not talking to has-beeners. He's not talking to used-to-bees. He's talking to the church. If you walk not after the flesh, but you walk after the spirit, there is there. For now, no condemnation. He understands. He spent years post-salvation, hidden away. And they had to send a man to get him. Hidden away, discarded because of the condemnation of Saul. Paul understands the tension. Paul understands the struggle. The apostle Paul understands. So he begins to describe the relationship. The relationship that the saint of God must manage. The realities and the struggles, if I could say it that way, of being the church, not being of the world, but being in the world. It's easy to join a church. It's easy to find a church these days. It's easy to join whatever church you find that you like. It's easy to find whatever flavor church you're looking for. It's easy to be welcomed in the church. It's easy to put your name on the road. Brother Masters, this, I hadn't heard this kind of language in a long time. We handed out a Bible or a baptismal certificate right here a few months ago, and somebody said, hey, I want to talk to you after church about moving my letter. How long has it been since you heard that? That's an old Baptist terminology for I want to move churches. You had to go with a letter. Maybe we should still do that. We don't, though. <laughs> it's easy to find a church, amen? It's easy it's easy, in fact, to articulate the biblical understanding of what a church is and what the church is. The church is not really that complicated, okay? But being the church when you're in a valley, being the church when you're in a plateau, being the church when you're being persecuted, being the church under pressure. Now, there's a challenge. There's a challenge. And we find, like most things, Dr. Toffler, Toffler, I think is his name, who was writing to the Supreme Court concerning um, physician-assisted suicide, made the statement, when trying to help someone who was suffering, Eliminating the one suffering is never the answer. Eliminating the sufferer is not the way to manage the suffering. And you know what we do? I've heard people say it out loud. I've heard preachers' kids with a call on their life after the failure of their father, moral failure of their father, tell me, I'm scared to go into ministry because I don't know if I won't wind up like he is if I'm used in the anointing. You know what that is? That's removing yourself from the tension of being the church, trying to alleviate the struggle and the pressure. Brother, sister, there's a reason we have opposing thumbs. Amen? Can you imagine if you had a left hand on your left arm and a left hand on your right arm? There's a reason tension is built 
in every walk of life. Quit trying to alleviate the tension. Just focus on being the church wherever you find yourself in life. Praise God. Somebody say amen. He, he comes out talking about creation. We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but us ourselves. We are, and he's using three words, groaning, travailing, and waiting. You don't reckon Paul knows about this? And then he synthesizes You can go to the next verse. He synthesizes this understanding that there is is immediately groaning, there is simultaneously groaning, travailing, and waiting, but he begins in his speech patterns to link it toward glory. How is it that we could experience glory at the same time that we are groaning and travailing And waiting. Can you say amen? Amen. There is this constant thing. I don't even know how to title it. He said, you don't have the verse. You don't have to turn to it. He says it in verse 21. He says that we we, we we live in a body that is corruptible. It is decaying. And so all the time, all at once, we are living in a body that is decaying. It is ever decaying. It, it, the, the world around us is ever decaying. The fleshly, the fleshly is in a constant state of decay. Can you say amen? amen? And our spirits look upward to a kingdom that is ever increasing. And we set our heart on the word of God that is... Amen? It is ever settled in heaven. And, and, and we, we put ourselves in the government that the Bible says of which there shall be no end. And so our physical, the physical, our, literally our flesh, but more, more, more importantly tonight, the fleshly among us is in decay while the spirit inside of us is in thriving mode. You're, you're going to... You're going to have to lose one or the other. To eliminate the tension means you're going to have to figure out a way to make the world not be a decaying thing or you're going to have to quit going upward. But notice what Paul says in Philippians. I stretch toward, I can't get out of this body, I can't get out of temptation, I can't get out of, uh, 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 of the finite I can't get out of the finitude. I can't can't get out of these holds and these bonds and these limitations, but I'm stretching. You can't stretch something without tension. Do I have any archers in the building? I have no archers in the building. Do I have any archers in the building? It takes tension. To make that work. And you can't alleviate it from either end. What's your job? Amen. That's why Pentecostals don't believe in crossbows. You're trying to alleviate the tension. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Now... Paul, Paul has experienced it. Paul has seen it. Paul has, has managed it. At the, at, by, the, by, the, by the end, in his sign-off, he said, I have ran the race, tension. I've, I, have, I have stayed the course, tension. There, there was a constant navigating. There was a constant moving. There was a con- Nevertheless, I die daily that I might mortify the de- You hear the consistency You hear the constant nature of his pressing in. What was he being? He was being the church. That's it. 
He was being the church. Groaning, travailing, waiting, reaching forward to a time and a moment of glory. Um, he, he goes from talking about the waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption. We are, we are not locking ourselves down. We are being the church. He tells one church, go and occupy until the Lord comes. Go do, go be the church. They quit coming to church. Quit, don't sell your house. Don't quit your job. Um, and quit coming and staying here. Quit, quit locking yourself down. Quit isolating yourself. Amen? Amen. We believe in insulating, not isolating. Man, y'all were so much louder than this the last month. We believe in insulating, not isolating. Amen? We believe in insulating, not isolate. Don't isolate yourself. You, 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 can't, you can't just come and sleep in the prayer rooms and bathe in the baptistry and, and, and eat out of the pantry and never walk out. No, you can't do that. And now that's a joke, but you also can't do it. You can't do it figuratively, but you can't do it literally. You can't go from church to house, to your little cubicle, never talking to anybody, never looking at anybody, never witnessing to anybody. No, that's not being the church. That's not being. The church prays. Yes, it does. The church worships. Yes, it does. But the church also helps, and the church also witnesses, and the church also testifies, and the church also reaches out, and the church also extends itself, and the church, whoa, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but the church shows itself to be the church. Amen. Amen. He begins to liken this tension to hope. I didn't do it. I, I wouldn't have done it. It's not the way my brain works. But watch what he says. For we. We wait for the adoption of the redemption of our body. Our spirits are pulsating, thriving, ever moving higher, waiting for the redemption of the rest of us. Amen? For we are saved. It's linear. He never leaves the subject. We're doing this, and here's why the tension must remain. Because we are saved by something we cannot see. We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen, realized, actualized, manifested, hope that we put our fingers on is not hope because what a man seeth, why would he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Paul's trying to tell us something. Get this destination out of your head. Get, get it, but, but to, while, while, while the church is still on the earth, the church is to do one thing. It is to be the church. The church is not headed to a destination on this earth. We are not as a local assembly headed to a destination on this earth. There will always be a need for the church. There will always be a need for the church to be the church where the church is. It is not in an arrival. It is not in a destination moment that you become the church. But in being the church, it allows you to wake up tomorrow morning and be the church. We're waiting. We're groaning. We're travailing. We're stuck in this tension. And here's why. Because it's like hope. Something that's ever driving you, something that's ever pulling for you, something that al allows you to wake up and pray. Likewise, look at your name and say, likewise. likewise. We don't say that word a lot. It means in like manner also. That's a biblical terminology or just like that. In the same way, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Literally weakness, fragility, frailty. We are weak, we are fragile, we are frail. We are, we are, it, it, it's really, it's hard to express the word. It simply means that there is a, a lack of capacity. Anybody ever wake up on Monday morning and just be like, I don't even know what's wrong with me, but I have a lack of capacity. Like old boy said, my get up and goes, done got up and went. Maybe, maybe all of y'all's amens done got up and went too. Because half of y'all is lying. Everybody know what that feels like. 
You know what that feels like. You know what it feels like mentally. You know what it feels like physically. And you know what it feels like spiritually. Yes, Amen. Amen. The Spirit helpeth our infirmities. It shores up. It bolsters our weakness. It bridges the gap where we have a lack of capacity. And it's just like hope. It does what hope does. It serves the purpose hope serves. It keeps me in tension. So I can be the church. The Spirit helps our infirmities, for we know not how to pray for as we ought to know. We ought to know. We ought to know. Can you imagine living a life? Can you imagine going to math class, Brother Williams, and every day you walk in and you ought to know what the teacher's saying, but you don't. How miserable that would be. I Trust me, I know exactly what that's like. <laughs> we ought to know some things. Have you ever been, I don't know, maybe this is just too transparent. We're just kind of, it's just us chickens around here tonight. And so I'm just kind of teaching and we're having a good time, I hope. You're having as much fun as I'm having. But Sister Nicole, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, man, I, I'd have known better than that. I have the Holy Ghost. What were you thinking? We know not how to pray sometimes as we ought to. What's that ought? That's the tension pulling us, expecting more out of us, showing us that there's room to grow, there's room to increase, there's room to exceed and to succeed and to excel is what I'm trying to say. There's always an ought to in front of us, and that's what the Spirit's doing. It helps, it bridges where we lack the capacity to get ourselves where we ought to be. And how does it do that? It makes intercession for us with what? The creation groaneth within ourselves. The Spirit amplifies what our own tension causes us to do. The Spirit does not alleviate the groaning. The Spirit adds to the groaning. The Spirit does not alleviate the tension. In fact, the Spirit yanks a little bit harder on that tense understanding and pulls us. When you get out of a red-hot prayer meeting... I had one man ask me, I was an evangelist years ago, and, and, and he said, man, it was good today. And I said, yeah, it was good. I don't feel like we quite got there. And he looked at me and he said, have you ever quite gotten there? And I mean, it, 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 it ruined me for about a week. And I began to realize, no, we never quite. Because you leave a red-hot service or a red-hot prayer meeting or a successful Bible study, you leave doing whatever, and it's not about me. It's not about, well, I wish I'd have said it this way or we could have done this or I should have prayed. No, 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 no. But it doesn't leave you satisfied. It leaves you at peace. It leaves you whole. It leaves you comforted. It leaves you balanced. But what do you do? What do you want? You want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. I think there was more. I left, and I don't think I had gotten to the dead end. There is no dead end to the journey of the church. Thank you, Jesus. You'll never know it all, never experience it all, never see it all. You'll never get so used to it all that it becomes just uh, hay, wood, and stuff. There will always be the Spirit of God doing with and for you what is innate within you already to do, and that is grown toward the capacity that we lack. The Spirit makes intercession for us. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he, Jesus, makes intercession for us according to the will of God. Watch the picture of what's going on. Watch the whole picture of these two verses. And you see somebody. They don't know what the will of God is. They don't know how to pray like they ought to pray. They are in this tension of being drugged by the Spirit. The elasticity that is being created by the tension the Holy Ghost is pulling on them. And they don't know. They don't have the answers. They don't, have, they, they don't feel like they're complete. They don't feel like they're quite everywhere. They need, you, anybody understand what I'm talking about on a Tuesday night? That is the picture we're looking at. And instead of alleviating that tension, the Holy Ghost will get in them. And they don't know the will of God, and they can't find the will of God, and they're having a hard time articulating even what they are seeing and what they do know. I'm, I'm talking to somebody. 
And what happens? The Spirit will do it according to the will of God. He will come in and He will inject the will of God into your prayers by stretching you with groanings that cannot be uttered. He makes intercession for us. How? In line with the will of God. When you not know how to pray like you ought to, the Holy Ghost comes in and He'll start stretching you to a language you've never spoken and a place you've never been and a depth you've never experienced and it's deeper and it's higher and it's wider and it's greater and it's more. According to whose will? God's will. So that a man who is simply resigning himself to the tension so that a man who is praying will be praying according to the will of God. Oh, I just wish I could do your will. Where has that help come? Could you describe to me, brother, where that, where that, what atmosphere In what universal construct do you have to be such that the Spirit will come in? Do I have to know a lot? Do I have to have great education? Do I have to be a preacher? Do I have to be an elder or deacon? Do I have to have come into church and read my Bible through like some of these elders have done 10 or 15 or 30 or 40 years? No, 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 no. What you have to be doing is you have to be the church because when you're praying, that's when you recognize, I don't know how to pray like I ought to. And here's what happens. We go for some time and we feel like everything's good and revival's kicking and life was good. And, and then we get to a spot where I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to do with this. This, this. this tension is killing me. I don't really know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to approach this. I don't know what to do with this issue. I don't know what to do with this problem. I don't know how to handle X and Y and Z and so forth. And what do we do? We just back up. We back up and we try to kick it in neutral to alleviate the tension. And he doesn't visit you in that way. And you don't fulfill the will of God. And your prayers don't line up like they should. Why? Not because you didn't know enough. It's okay. In fact, in your lack of capacity, he will come to you if you'll be the church. Let me say that plainly. It's when you're praying that the Spirit makes intercession for you with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's when you're praying, not even knowing how to pray like you should, that the Holy Ghost will come in and interject. He will impute the will of God into you. You won't know it, and it'll keep you reaching because you can't ever put your hands on it. Because if you could put your hands on it, and you could leverage it, and you could manipulate it for yourselves, that accomplishment we want to accomplish and we want to see the work complete but that accomplishment itself would cause the process to cease because when you get to your arrival on the plane what do you do? you don't just wave at your arrival gate at 35,000 feet you come down, you stop and the pressure decreases and the oxygen's better And there's no turbulence in there. Because if you got there, you would stop. You'd stop praying. You'd stop growing. And little by little, by little by little, by little by little, you'd stop being the church. Oh, praise God. What's my solution? Be the church. Stay in the tension. Revel in the tension. Learn how to thrive in the tension. You don't need to feel condemnation, but you need to feel the tension pulling on you. That means your spirit is growing up, even though your flesh is decaying. That means you're doing what John prayed. He must increase. He is increasing in you, and your flesh is decreasing, and it's going to increase the poles. The polar tension between the two will be constantly increasing. Beware. 
If you could come to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Tuesday night and not feel the tension. Something about you is not, is not modeling John's prayer. I must decrease and he must increase. The I in me must decrease and the he in me must increase. There must be tension. The church is always under pressure. Like Alexander the Great, who sat in the corner of his palace after having so swiftly conquered the world. In fact, in biblical records, the Bible characterizes him as a swift general subduing the nations around him. History records that he sat in the corner of his room and he wept for there were no more nations to conquer. And thus came the fall of the Grecian Empire. We are not trying to alleviate, alleviate the tension. We are trying to be the church. There is no retirement on this side of the rapture from being the church. There is no retirement on this side of the rapture from being the church. As long as we are the church on planet earth, there will be tension. There will be temptation. There will be, there will be a reason to skip. There will be a reason to not be faithful. There will be a reason to turn your eyes and avert them away from the things. that There will always be reason. Amen. We must continue to be the church. So he helps our weaknesses. And he, and he stretches us further. And then that gives way to what is the last tidbit of the evening. Hope is likened under the tension. Keeps me reaching. Even the way the Spirit moves through us. Intercession in its most elemental design is like hope, which is like the tension of living for God. And we, somebody shout we. 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 Who is we? The church. We know that all things work together for the good. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Paul is talking about the church. Everything will click together if you'll just keep being the church. I know you don't understand, but everything will snap in place if you'll just keep being the church. I know you've got more questions at times than you've got answers, but things will take formation and things will make sense if you'll just keep being the church. He pulls together the groaning and the travailing and the waiting and the tension. And he says, these things work together. They are co-laborers with prayer. These things. Somebody say, these things. All things. These things. They co-labor. They are fellow laborers with your being the church, with your prayer. They co-labor with your, with your fasting. They co-labor with your faithfulness. They co-labor with your giving. They co-labor with, with, your, with your Bible reading. Thank you, Sister Gala. They co-labor. They go together with. You can't become what God intends for you to become without them working together. Praise God. Praise God. And so we, the church, know that all things work together. They co-labor together with our, with our continuing, with our moving forward. We must go through these things. Peter talks about trials in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. 
that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. That's, 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 uh, let's read the sentence all the way through. That the trial of your faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory. The trial of your faith. There's going to be tension. There's going to be pressure. But, but we want to keep on being the church. Because where it can be applied, where it can be cast out as praise and honor and glory is at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You can't cash out before then. You can't retire before then. You can't alleviate the tension before then. You can't quit being the church before then. We need to be actively being the church Day in, day out, school, Walmart, cubicle, business, street corner. And in our occupying, he will come. And the trial of your faith will be much more precious than of any gold that could perish. In Jesus' name. Who? Who is seeing the thing? Sister Jody, please come. Who is seeing this? Who is believing this? We, the church. Those that are being the church, we have this knowledge, we have this confidence. We are persuaded that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. The word purpose is the same word used where He is describing how He intentionally placed the shoe bread in the tabernacle where it was. He put it under the light of the menorah, the seven-armed candlestick. He purposely placed the shoe bread. He put it on display. All things work together for them that love God and are called according to His display. Putting something out in a spot where it can be displayed. Amen. Being the church means you're going to get put in tense places. You're going to get put in pressure cooker situations. But when you get there, your coworkers get to watch you go through it with grace. Your backslidden family gets to watch you in display form go through it with patience run the race. The world around us got to watch us go through COVID with the Holy Ghost. That's who is determined. Hey, I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about the tension. I'm not worried about the persecution. I'm not worried about the pressure. I'm just going to keep on being the church. I'm just going to wake up every morning and I'm going to pray and I'm going to study the Word of God and I'm going to eat the things of God and I'm going to be faithful to the kingdom of God and and when the doors are open, I'm going to be there and I'm going to I'm just going to be the church. I'm going to tell somebody. I'm going to testify. I'm going to be the church. Praise God. Stand with me if you would. And he just keeps on going because, 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 because. If you were at the marriage retreat a few years ago, you understand this joke. You're supposed to talk to your wife and look back. And when she tells you what she expects out of you, you're supposed to say it back in your own words and then say, because, because, because. Anybody remember that? You better be raising your hand, young men, even if you weren't there. Because, because, because. Paul is on this rambling because. The tension is there because you were unrighteous, but now you're righteous. And, and hope is that same way. In fact, that's how we remain righteous, by hope. Because hope is like this. Because, likewise, the Spirit is like this. Because we know because. And here's his last one. Because whom he did for no. I don't have time to go through it. Just look at your neighbor and say, He's known me for a long time. Whom he did foreknow, that's the church. There was always a plan for the Gentiles. There was always a plan for the Gentiles. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
His intention for you is to become the church who is the body of Christ. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate that we might be like the image of his son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And then he called, he justified. And who he justified, he glorified. You see the transition as the tension grows until, until. So what do you mean by predestination, preacher? Do we believe in predestination? Do we believe in once saved, always saved, that when you were born, you were predestined to either be saved or, or you were predestined to be lost? Do we believe in that? We believe in predestined of two things. We believe in the predestination of nations, and we believe in the predestination of the entity called the church. And I've got scriptures that the media team has. I'm not going to go through it. Ephesians chapter 1. Don't put it up there, but just you can go read it. Ephesians 1 and 1, Ephesians 1 and 5, Ephesians 1 and 15, Matthew 16, 18. Not Matthew 16, 18. I can't remember. The media team can give you the notes. He says things about the church like, I will present to myself a glorious church. He says things about the church like, that he might, um, that he might present to himself. And, 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 and he, he talks about the church being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We believe in the predestination of the church. What does that mean? It simply means God will have a people. And you can be a part of that people. Or you can choose to spend your time trying to figure out how to twist the knobs and pull the levers to alleviate the tension of being the church. But he will have a church. And it will be tried by fire. And it will be found glorious and spotless and wonderful. Can you say amen? So he foreknows me. And he predestinates me to be in the church. And he, if... If he wants a church, he has to call a church. So who whom he predest he predestinates a church. He said, I'm going to have one. And he calls me to be in it. And, and here the tension grows. Because the very meaning of the church itself is the called out ones. Ones who have been called out. Ek, the prefix meaning out of. And lesia, the word literally means called upon. When he calls on you, he doesn't call on you where you are. He calls you with one purpose, to pull you out from where you are. Creates immediately, his calling creates tension. And then if that's not enough, he justifies you. You ever been in a room when you know you did something wrong, but the teacher takes up for you anyway? And it's like pins and needles and you don't know what to do with your hands? It's a tense moment. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And as if predestination wasn't enough, as if calling you out wasn't enough, then in front of the entire world and Lucifer himself, he justifies you. And the tension grows. But there's coming a day where then the Bible says he will glorify those who he has justified and called and predestinated. How, what do we do? I can't tell you how many new converts have come to me in the last six months. I said, Brother Ryder, what now? What do I do now? What can I do now? And I wish I had a good answer. But my real answer to you is the same answer that I'd give our oldest saint. Go be the church. And we have some programs and we have some protocols and some structure that can help you to do that. But being the church is what you've been called to do. Being the church is why he justified you. And being the church is how he's going to glorify you. You must be the church. You must be the church. 
there's, there's those as we gather to pray at this altar for just a few moments. There are those who are experiencing the all things. And, and, and we get kind of wrapped up in the all things. And we get our brain and our eyes and our minds and our ears so laser focused on the things that we forget about the together part. Because if all you're doing is surviving the things, then the things have nothing to co-labor with. And they're not going to work together to good if they don't have anything to work together with. So there must be a gathering. There must be a gathering. And with the circumstances, there must be dedication. And with the issues, there must be prayer. And with the problems, there must be fa- You understand what I'm saying? We have to maintain being the church while going through these things. And then all things, everybody say all. They're all. And they're all encompassing. And if we focus on it, all are against me and, and everybody's out for me and, and the devil and, and all, and it's looming and it's big and it's overwhelming and go two more verses. Two more verses. And watch what happens when we understand if we'll just stay in the tension. What shall we say then And look, as Paul kind of, kind of, kind of talks about them now like they're just this meager sideline thing. What shall we say then to these things? Then, what's then? When we've decided to stay in the tension. (laughs) And when we're under pressure, be the church under pressure. And when you're under scrutiny, be the church under scrutiny. And when you're in temptation, be the church in temptation. Because Christ was tempted in all eyes, wise like as we, yet without sin. And when people lie on you, be the church. And when life deals you a lemon, be the church. Am I preaching to anybody on Tuesday night? And when things are hard and nothing's fair, be the church. And you get yourself in the same position. You will begin to speak like Paul because you understand the tension is there because a church is predestinated. The tension is there because I've been called to be a part of that predestination. The tension is there because he's justified me even when I was wrong. The tension's there because everything pulling back on me knows I'm headed to a day of glory. And when you get your mind wrapped around that, then you get the same attitude Paul gets. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If we'll just be the church. So what in the waiting, Brother Ryder, what do I do? Pastor, what do I do in the in the in-between time? What do I do when things are still co-laboring together and it's fireworks and chaos and hard times? What do I do? Be the church. Be the church. Weep with someone else that's weeping. Rejoice with someone else that's rejoicing. Do what the people of God do. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together like some do because we have no such custom. Anybody know the rest of that scripture? In the churches. Be the church. Love like the church. Give like the church. Worship like the church. Dance like the church. Act like somebody who's been justified in your own sin. Act like somebody who's taken on the righteousness of God when even my righteousness is like a filthy rag. Be the church.
be the church. Why don't you put your arm around your neighbor? They're going to sing a song. You've had, you've had 48 hours since you were with this people to pray for yourself. So I don't want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray for your neighbor. God, anoint us to be the church. God, anoint us to be the church. God, help me to encourage my brother. God, help me to encourage my sister. In anything, Lord, you can use me. Use me as the church. If you can use Encourage me in my prayer Lord, you can so I can encourage somebody me. on the phone. If you can use anything, visit me in my prayer closet so when I visit somebody from the church, that residue rubs off on them and it lifts their head. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Come on, brother, come on, sister. Take my heart. Don't be afraid of the tension. Don't be run off by the tension. You can use anything, Lord. Thank you so much for joining us for service today on live stream. If you'd like to see more content from Souls Harbor, you can check our YouTube channel out. And if you'd like to know some details about the various ministries of Souls Harbor, you can see some of that on our website. We're praying for you and believing that God's moving on you and that his hand is going to work a miracle in your life.